Okay, so next session is we're going to have a one of the most exciting talk um, about the clinical applications of the GLAD microbiomes uh, from Professor Francis Chan. I believe that um, no need for very much introductions about Professor Chan. Uh, now she's the leader of many aspects of the GIs, including H. Perry and SETS, upper HIV building, and right now she moves a little bit more to the microbiota. Francis, please. Yeah, thank you for your very kind invitation. It's really my honor to come over to Thailand to meet up with so many good friends after three years of the pandemic. The title of my presentation is Clinical Applications of Gut Microbiota. And this is my disclosure statement. Um, what exactly is gut microbiota? What I have to say is that we are less than 1% ourselves, considering the fact that there are only 20,000 human genes, but there are up to 20 million microbial genes. So we are just 1% of ourselves. Mind you, we cannot easily change our human genome from our parents, but we may be able to manipulate our gut microbiome to predict disease and to improve health. Uh, now there's good evidence that dysbiosis or alteration in the balance between good and bad bacteria is linked to many human diseases because of these various axes. And in the past, germs, we talk about germs, but until recently, this term gut microbiome becomes a buzzword not only in the medical and science journal, but also in the business sector and also in night shows, health talks. Uh, since 2019, uh, our team in 6K, led by myself and uh, Professor Silton, has uh, established this uh, only government-funded microbiome innovation and technology center in the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Our mission is really to translate our exciting discoveries into clinical application. And in this government-funded laboratory, we had state-of-the-art facilities, including on the left-hand side, uh, high-throughput metagenomic sequencing, this mega-scale anaerobic chamber, as well as notable facilities, which allow us to realize some of the important discoveries that could not be done in the past. And I would love to kind of collaborate with our colleagues here in Asia. In particular, we have established the very first FMT Stu Bao Bank, and the standard has been benchmarked with the FMT facilities uh, that has been licensed by the UK Regulatory Authority. And in fact, we do have guidelines in Asia, which has been endorsed by the APAG and the APSDE, that uh, we have the clinical practice guidelines with regard to the preparation and screening of school donor and the clinical indications for FMT. And during the COVID pandemic, we have come up with the protocol for screening FMT donors, whereas many other centers had closed the operation because of the COVID pandemic. Now today, I'm not going to talk about FMT, but rather I would like to share with you some clinical applications of our exciting microbiome discoveries in the Magic Center in the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. In particular, I would like to talk about the clinical applications for COVID-19, long COVID, colorectal neoplasm, and other exciting diagnostic and therapeutic products in the R&D pipeline. First of all, with regard to COVID pandemic, to date, more than 600 million cases have been diagnosed and with unfortunately more than 6 million deaths. Often we ask ourselves, why are some people more susceptible? Why do some have worse outcomes? And importantly, can we boost our natural or acquired immunity against COVID-19? Now we know that COVID-19 is not just the respiratory disease. In fact, our human gut is the target. And there's good data showing that, in fact, the total number of A2 receptors for SARS-CoV-2 is far more than in the gut than those in the lung. So what is the connection between the gut and the lung? In fact, it has been shown that by fermentation of the fibers we took, in the guts, by the guts commensal bacteria, it will lead to the generation of this short-chain fatty acid, SCFA. And this short-chain fatty acid will have anti-inflammatory response in the lung. And therefore, 
the composition of gut microbiota will have a significant impact on the outcome of COVID infection. And in fact, our group is among the first to show that alteration in gut microbiota happened in patients who are hospitalized for severe COVID-19 infection. And importantly, we found that the gut microbiome composition actually reflects the disease severity and dysfunctional immune response in patients with COVID-19. Now, I'll give you an example. In this study, we found that those who had severe or even critical COVID-19 had depletion of certain gut commensals known to have immunoregulatory function, including the Fecalibacterium, Eubacterium, and Ruminococcus species. And we can see that these are closely associated, meaning those with severe and critical COVID infection, they tend to have more depleted immunoregulatory gut bacteria. So the question that we all often ask is, are these observations only confined to the patients in Hong Kong? In fact, we have done a study in collaboration with colleagues in Japan. In short, we found that there are overlapping microbial signatures for COVID-19, meaning the depletion in this important immunoregulatory bacteria or the enrichment of bad bacteria are really independent of geographic locations. So what is the impact of our findings? Um, since the reporting of this finding, um, the findings has been reported globally, and importantly, it has been suggested that gut microbiome may help or hinder the defenses against SARS-CoV-2. In other words, can we modulate the gut microbiome to improve our clinical outcome? I believe there may be different possibilities, but I would like to focus more on the administration of microbial consortia, including the use of pre or probiotics for the treatment of COVID-19. And using our huge microbiome data sets, we were fortunate in that by big data analysis and followed by machine learning, we were able to come up with an oral microbial formula we call SIM01 against COVID-19. And in an open label pilot study, we found that this SIM01 gut microbiota derived symbiotic formula uh, can be used in, as an actuated therapy for patients who are hospitalized for COVID-19. For example, in this open label pilot study, we found that those who received SIM01 as shown by this blue bar at a significantly higher level of neutralizing antibody than the control group. And in terms of the pro-inflammatory cytokines in the blood, those who received this SIM01 had a significant reduction as compared to people, patients who did not receive this treatment. What about the durability of vaccine response? Can modulation of gut microbiome improve vaccine response and also at the same time reduce possible side effects associated with COVID-19 vaccine. And we have known for so many years that the composition and function of the gut microbiota are really crucial factors that modulate the immune response of vaccination, whether you talk about influenza vaccine or COVID-19 vaccine. And in this particular study, we look into the gut microbiota composition in patients before and after um, um, vaccination with this SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. We look into both the vaccine immunogenicity and adverse effects by measuring the serial stool for metagenome sequencing as well as the serological response. Uh, um, to cut a long story short, we have identified specific bacteria that associated with more or less side effects with COVID-19 and therefore, by this combination of bacteria, we have been able to discover the combination that would affect the efficacy of COVID-19 as well as reducing the common side effects of these COVID-19 vaccines. And in this large-scale double-blind randomized trial, we have successfully recruited over 450 patients suffering from diabetes, 
uh, and other comorbidities, and they are above the age of 65. The endpoints were adverse clinical outcomes adjudicated by a blind committee, as well as looking into whether this SIM01 will be able to restore gut dysbiosis. So these eligible patients, after receiving the first COVID uh, vaccine, were randomized to receive SIM01 or placebo. And they were followed serially up to 12 months to measure the gut uh, microbiota using metagenomic sequencing, as well as uh, the clinical outcomes. And we found that over a period of 12 months, those who received this SIM01, as shown by this orange bar, has significantly reduced clinical adverse outcomes adjudicated by the panel, as well as reduction in the incidence of other sepsis with or without hospitalization compared to patients who only received placebo. At the same time, using short gun metagenomic analysis, we found that those patients, those COVID pa uh, patients who received SIM01 had a significant restoration of gut dysbiosis comparing to the placebo group, meaning that the clinical improvement we observed can be explained by restoration of gut dysbiosis. So in summary, we believe that restoration of gut dysbiosis using this novel SIM01 combination leads to enhanced neutralizing antibody formation and lower inflammatory response in hospitalized COVID-19 patients. It could also elevate antibody response with COVID vaccines for both BioNTech and CoronaVac. And we observe less COVID vaccine related side effects and lower risk of other forms of sepsis uh, uh, sepsis during this study period. And, and luckily, we have had this opportunity to launch this um, um, SIM01 oral microbiome formula um, um, uh, some two years ago, and it is now available not only in Hong Kong, but in quite a few parts of Asia. And up and in addition to COVID-19, we also look into the clinical application of gut microbiome in patients who have recovered from COVID. Now we are well aware of the condition called long COVID, which can affect 75% of COVID-19 patients. And the trouble is these patients, they often suffer from more than one symptoms affecting multiple systems. And in effect, as I mentioned, more than 75% of the COVID recovered patients. There are many theories behind long COVID, such as persistent viral infection, autoimmunity, organ tissue damage, and gut dysbiosis. To date, I have to say that only gut microbiome dysbiosis has been shown, at least with published data in the literature, that is associated with long COVID. And in fact, our group is among the first to show that in a prospective cohort of patients with post-acute COVID-19, there was a significant enrichment and depletion of certain combination of gut microbiota. And that accounts for the majority of patients suffering from fatigue, poor memory, and hair loss. And also we use multi-kingdom gut microbiota analysis, meaning we analyze not only the changes in the bacteria, but also the other dark matter in the gut, meaning the fungi, virus, and also the metabolomic functions. And we are able to identify and predict long COVID. And using this machine learning model, we can accurately predict the risk of long COVID with a sensitivity of 95% and a specificity of 92%. And interestingly, we found that for patients with different subtypes of long COVID, some patients may have predominantly GI, respiratory, musculoskeletal, or CNS symptoms. They have distinct subtype patterns associated with different patterns of gut microbiome, meaning by looking into the different subtypes of gut dysbiosis, we were able to explain and predict the different subtypes of long COVID. So this is the kind of metagenomic based long COVID test that's been launched in Hong Kong. And we were able to 
with a collection of the species, test and predict the development of long COVID and different subtypes of long COVID. Therefore, we will be able to offer hope through modulation of gut microbiota to alleviate long COVID symptoms. Now, we like to change the different topic is about the use of gut microbiota for non-invasive diagnosis of colorectal cancer and adenoma. For many years now, we have good evidence that gut dysbiosis accounts for colorectal cancer. You can see in this diagram that the bacterial composition in healthy gut mucosa, healthy colonic mucosa, is very different from those who develop mature carcinoma. Certain bacteria such as Fusobacterium, Enterobacterium, are important pathogenetic bacteria in terms of the development of colorectal adenoma and even colorectal cancer. Certainly, one may question, is this a chicken or egg phenomenon? Are these bacteria contributing to the pathogenesis of colorectal neoplasms? Or because of the change of this neoplasm leading to a more hostile gut environment? In CHK, our group have shown in an animal model that by gavaging fecal samples from patients with colorectal cancer, actually it would promote intestinal carcinogenesis in germ-free and conventional mice, meaning that these bacteria actually lead to the development of colorectal neoplasms, including gastric cancer, uh, uh, colorectal cancer. And over the last 10 years, using metagenomic analysis, we have identified distinct patterns of gut dysbiosis in patients with colorectal cancer. And over the years, we're able to use quantitative PCR to identify certain bacterial gene markers for colorectal cancer. And using a combination of microbial gene markers, we call it M3CLC, we were able to screen colorectal cancer with a specificity of 85% and a sensitivity of 94% using a large sample of patients in Hong Kong and also mainland China. Comparing with fecal immunotest, we found that for fecal immunotest, the performance for early colorectal cancer such as stage one and stage two is really poor. Whereas using M3CLC, we were able to achieve a sensitivity of 90% or even above, even for very early stage colorectal cancer, meaning this would be a useful non-invasive test for early detection of colorectal cancer. Again, you can ask, gut microbiota is population specific and dependent on different geographic locations. Could this test be applicable to other ethnicities and other geographic locations? We've done this network meta-analysis and try to compare uh, the colorectal cancer patients in Hong Kong, in the US, those in Europe, including Austria and France. We found that in summary, those important gut microbial gene markers leading to colorectal cancers are really consistent across different populations. And now we are conducting a large scale prospective clinical trial to confirm this clinical observation. And other very exciting new finding is that this M3CLC test not only can predict early colorectal cancer, but it can also predict patients with a history of colorectal adenoma and the prediction of adenoma recurrence achieved a sensitivity of 90% with a specificity of 87%, so that we will be able to triage the right patient for colonoscopy for detection of recurrent adenoma. So this is the M3CLC test that we launched in Hong Kong last year. And I uh, would like to share with you that this is the kind of technology, which is a QP cell based technology. We identify these markers and come up with a test score and we'll be able to report the results in two weeks. And in comparison with other non-invasive blood or stool tests, I would like to say that while the sensitivity for colorectal cancer and specificity are comparable, uh, 
This M3CLC test has a unique advantage of detecting both advanced adenoma and non-advanced adenoma. And it is the only test that can detect recurrence of colorectal adenoma, whereas other non-invasive tests fail to achieve this particular target. So this is the kind of report that one can receive. With this bacterial gene marker test, it not only informs you about your risk of developing colorectal adenoma and colorectal cancer, but at the same time, we would offer hope to modulate your patient's risk of developing colorectal cancer through changes in lifestyle microbiota modulation. So there are other exciting new developments in the R&D pipeline. For example, now we're working on this gut-brain access in children with autism. And we have reported this very interesting observation that certain bacteria associated with neurotransmitter activities were actually substantially reduced in children with autism, as shown by these red dots. And these microbial functions relating to neurotransmitter biosynthesis are significantly reduced in children with ASD compared to typically developing normal children. And in fact, uh, we found that the changes in this gut microbial ecological network, this is for ASD and this is for the normal children, suggest that the interspecies communication or interplay was significantly ordered in children with autism. And we very much hope that we will be able to come up with a stool test that will be able to predict the development of autism for children who are just one year or below. And this has been reported in the literature and has stimulated a lot of discussions in, in the media. At the same time, we are now working on an artificial intelligence multi-class diagnosis. We hope we will be able to detect multiple diseases, including coronary artery disease, cancer, um, irritable bowel syndrome, obesity, and inflammatory bowel disease. So far, we can be able to achieve a sensitivity of up to 95% and a specificity of 98%. And it is a hope that in the future, with this all-in-one platform, we can truly achieve screening of multiple diseases with a single stool test. So next time when I invite Professor Sukano to Hong Kong, we may be able to ask Professor Sukano to sit here, and then with this belt, we will be able to collect your stool and be able to tell you in a single test your health and disease conditions. So therefore, next time when you're about to flush your toilet, think about it. Don't flush away too early because just a little bit of stew will be able to save your life. And I believe one teaspoon of stew may be able to protect your disease. And I hope gut microbiota will become fecal bacterial DNA based diagnostics in the near future. Thank you for your kind attention. Francis, thank you so much for your fascinating talk. And do you have any questions from the floor? Yes, Sugano, Professor Sugano. Please. Mr. Sugano, you like to share your stool, right? <laughs> well, I think uh, Japanese uh, industry will probably develop smart, uh, you know, flush toilet that sends immediately the, uh, your microbiota and the risk of the colorectal cancer combined with your technology. I think uh, your group are now in the center stages at the uh, era of uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemics. And uh, I'm, I believe that the, uh, we are approaching to the end of this uh, uh, pandemics and uh, severe restrictions of the, all the activities. And I hope uh, your group still uh, keep leading us uh, for this aspect. My yeah, brief comment is that the, uh, you use oral microbiota uh, to uh, reduce the uh, symptoms. I think the uh, bifidobacterium and the probiotic, one of the probiotic, might be another candidate for uh, reducing the uh, severity of the COVID-19. How do you think? Yes, Professor Kano, you quite rightly pointed out that there's in fact a lot of potential in the development of um, uh, microbiome, gut microbiome, into next generation medicine. 
This is what we call life biotherapeutics. Now, in fact, a number of big pharmaceutical companies in the United States, including Faring and a few others, are working towards this direction, but the focus is mainly on um, uh, gut microbiome as biotherapeutics for clostridium deficit infection. I believe there will be a lot of potential for discovering gut microbiome as life biotherapeutics for many other conditions, including obesity, reduction in cancer, and other many other conditions. And I very much hope that we will be able to work together to ensure that we will be able to find those microbial signatures that is applicable to different populations in Asia. Yeah, the reason why I asked the uh, question is that the oral microbiota, predominant species, aerobics or you know regular anaerobics not absolute anaerobics but the uh, most of the you know uh, anaerobics absolute anaerobics uh, reside in the deeper part of the intestine and uh, so uh, more important uh, uh, role of them would be regulating immune reactions because of the uh, origin of immune uh, generation is occurring at the end of the idiom. So that's why I'm asking, and I'm amazed, you know, the uh, previous speakers uh, finding this alopecia <laughs> totally recovered. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comment, <laughs> Professor Sagano. Um, so we have a last question from the online participants. Francis, oh, sometimes we have to use the, the microbiota treatments, especially for FMT in the immunocompromised host. And as you know, they have a publications in New National Medicines uh, many months ago mentions about the treatments in the patients with chronic hep C cirrhosis and uh, with the MDS and have very fatal serious side effects. So whenever we have to use the FMT in the immunocompromised host, what is your suggestion? Yeah, in fact, uh, we have uh, performed uh, FMT in over 500 patients in Hong Kong. Some are due to recurrent sedative, others are for research indications. In particular, we do not find FMT to be a threat to immunocompromised patients because we have done it on a number of children suffering from graft versus host disease, and it had led to complete cure of the condition. The most important thing is that ESBL is very prevalent in Asia. For example, in Hong Kong, the prevalence of ESBL positivity is over 80%. And I believe it is similar uh, in, in other parts of Asia, with the possible exception of Japan. And therefore, it is very important to screen for ESBL posit positivity, because that has been shown to lead to septicemia and even fatality after FMT. Thank you so much for your excellent talk and very clear answers. So please give a big hand to Mr. Chance again. Thank you. Thank you.